There's a restlessness right now, a perfect storm, if you will, that sparked people to rise up and say, in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, enough is enough. You may already know me. You may already know me because you were with me on the campaign trail with Senator Bernie Sanders in 2016 or as the president of our revolution as I've continued to travel all over this country galvanizing, motivating, and organizing the grassroots. You may already know me for my electrifying, magnetic introductions and speeches right before Senator Sanders took the stage in 2020. You may already know me because you live in the great state of Ohio and you have seen me in action on the Senate floor or in the Cleveland City Council or traveling the state on Governor Kasich's task force for community and police relations. You may already know me because you have seen me countless times speaking a type of truth to power that makes people uneasy. I am Nina Turner, and I am a hell-raising humanitarian. I am a wife, I am a mother, and oh my God, I am a new glamma. As my brother says, stop deluding myself. I'm a new grandmother. He said, don't matter how much fanciness you put on it, be proud of that. Yes, I am a yaya. But more importantly, I am your sister if you believe in justice. I am your Conrad if you believe in equity and equality. And so let us continue to commune together to do what we can where we are with what we have and to know that everybody, no matter the fancy title or not, everybody is somebody. Hello, somebody. Juneteenth was June 19th, 1865. It was really a creation to commemorate because the last enslaved people found out that they were free on that day in Galveston, in Texas, the state of Texas. And that was two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And some historians believe that a lot of the slave owners in Texas already knew that the Emancipation Proclamation had set enslaved people free in Texas, but they decided to withhold that information because they wanted to get another cotton crop season out of the enslaved people. I mean, how cruel do you have to be to know that things have changed, but yet and still you have profit at the top of your mind? I guess that should not be so surprising because slavery was all about profit on the bodies and the livelihoods of black people for generations. So we find ourselves in 2020 with the demonstrations, 21st century versions of revolution is happening all over the world, sparked by the killing. Some people call it the lynching of George Floyd. And there have been many unfortunate killings of unarmed black people, both men and women at the hands of law enforcement even before we got to George Floyd. But this particular one with COVID very much in the foreground with almost 41 million people filing for unemployment. There's a restlessness right now, a perfect storm if you will, that sparked people to rise up and say in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, enough is enough and that's what we see and we do see people from all backgrounds all walks of life participating we see people from other countries standing in solidarity with the african-american community we see a deeper understanding of what that slogan black lives matter means 
I often put the T-O-O to it, Black Lives Matter 2, to drive home a finer point. Because when the Black Lives Matter movement first started, many people did not understand it. A lot of people, especially white people, resented it. And that was not just those who, from a political perspective, considered themselves Republicans. There were a lot of so-called Democrats who also had a problem with the movement itself. And you fast forward to 2020. For some, you know, everybody that's out on the front line is not necessarily there for the right reasons. I've seen countless videos. I've spoken to people who feel as though some people are trying to co-opt this movement, especially some white people. I saw a video of a white young lady. Her colleague was filming her and she was dressed in a long skirt and mid her midsection was showing and she was acting like she was at a damn fashion show. And as the protesters are walking by and Dr. Victoria Dooley, one of my comrades, put a tweet caption on top of that and said, wow, I'm really glad my life matters now. And if you, you would have to see the video to understand what she was saying. It was, it was as if this was just some fly by night, some spur of the moment. Oh, let me fashionably step into the streets with my Black Lives Matter t-shirt on to declare Black Lives Matter. I mean, she kind of slinked over like she was on a, on a catwalk. It was just, it was infuriating is what it was because for her, this was just a way to, to get more views on her social media. For black people, this is really about life or death. And then there are many white people who do understand that. So let me in my kind of painting a picture here. I'm just trying to find some balance that you do have people who really don't care. They're using this for their own ends. I've also seen footage of black people saying to white people, don't loot, don't tag buildings with Black Lives Matter because you're going to make it harder for us. Don't do this in our community. This is really our movement and our push. And so that is what white America has to understand that if you are of the mind to really help and support this movement, this revolution, this statement, this global statement of we're tired of this, we're not going to take it anymore. You definitely should take the lead of the African-American community and under, try to understand what the pain means. This is not just about the murder of George Floyd, but it is about the murder of generations of African-Americans, too numerous to count. Uh, souls and livelihoods and opportunities stolen or denied. This does not always have to end in a physical death, but there is a spiritual death, a mental death, a political death, an economic death that African Americans have been suffering since the first African slave was brought to this continent. And quite frankly, it has never stopped. You know, Looking at some of the laws that are being proposed, thank God for that, that this awakening is not because elected officials finally got a clue. It is because people have taken it to the streets. That is why we see uh, from city councils to legislatures introducing laws that reflect the mood of this country. I know that the Congressional Black Caucus is leading an effort called Justice and Policing Act 2020 where they, in their proposed legislation, want to ban chokeholds and no-knock warrants. Let us not forget that Breonna Taylor was killed in her home. She was asleep, and police officers had a no-knock warrant, and they shot into her place about 27 times. I believe nine of those bullets hit Breonna Taylor and left her dead. Her boyfriend or fiance thought that their home was being broken into and he had a weapon and he displayed a natural response at that time of the morning that is normal, which is I must protect my family, myself. And police officers did that. There was no reason to go into that home at that time of the morning, wee hours of the morning. She was murdered flat out. So banning the use of chokeholds and no-knock warrants is certainly a, a start. Uh, they want to limit the amount of military-grade equipment given to local authorities by the feds. Somehow, we have we thought as a nation that it's okay to militarize the police. You know, the Army, the Marine, the Air Force, the Navy, 
compared to domestic law enforcement, two different functions. One is supposedly to protect and serve, although the African-American community has never, and I say never globally, mean it, never, as a total community, been served by law enforcement. It is always a relationship of occupation. Now, that does not mean that the African-American community over time has not had the necessity of calling the police and building relationships with police. I mean, for myself, I served as a Cleveland City Councilwoman, so I had to build a relationship with law enforcement. I can see clear as if it happened yesterday, sitting in my council office and fielding calls from elders who had some concerns about crime. I get it. I, I get it on both sides more than people could ever, ever know, uh, both being the wife of a retired police officer and the mother of a son who is serving as a law enforcement officer right now today, who is a millennial, who I worry about every single day because he does have a badge and he does have a gun and he does remind me all the time, Mom, I am not wearing my bulletproof vest to make a fashion statement meaning that law enforcement work is absolutely dangerous. No doubt about it. You can come across a person or persons who mean to do you harm. No doubt. But my son is also a black man who is a millennial in America whose badge and gun does not protect him from the same racism, bigotry, discrimination, side eyes that any other black man or black woman in America would get. In many ways, he gets it doubly because now because of this environment and because of a system that allowed law enforcement to run roughshod over the African-American community and too many cases be the judge, jury, and executioner, it puts my son in even more jeopardy. When rioting broke out in Cleveland or demonstrations, depending on who you talk to, but downtown at the Justice Center, my first thought was, where is my son? I had my siblings call me, his aunts and his uncles. They wanted to know, where is our nephew? Is he safe? That was their first instinct. And they are black in America and they understand the burden and the sorrow and the hurt and the pain. First thought though, because of my son is, where is my nephew? And my first thought is, where is my son and is he safe? And mama mode kicked in real quick as I begun to say to myself, I wish a mofo would because my baby, my son serves in the best tradition of what it means to protect and serve and certainly understands the, both the burden and the authority that he carries and trying to navigate in the world that is totally upside down and has been upside down for a very long time. This is not new. This has been going on generation after generation after generation after generation after generation and black America has been screaming to white America, see us and feel our pain. And but for smartphones, people would have believed what those law enforcement officers, those police officers said about George Floyd. They said he was resisting arrest. That is always the standard line when police are dealing with the African-American community or when they want to cover something up. Now, that is not to say that sometimes people are not resisting, but that's their fallback. They say that all the time. They were resisting so that they can justify treatment and for all of us who have seen that video of George Floyd gasping for air, pleading for his life as this police officer put the full force and weight of his knees, his body on this man's neck as bystanders walked by and said, blood is coming out of his ears. That did not move this law enforcement officer. As a matter of fact, it seemed as though he shifted his weight even more strongly upon George Floyd's neck in total defiance as he had his hands in his pocket and staring at the people walking by trying to save George Floyd's life. The officer didn't say a word, but his eyes said it all. 
I double dog dare you to, to say anything about what I am doing. He was totally defiant and did not care that George Floyd was inevitably taking his last breath as three other officers stood around and let their colleague kill this man in cold blood. I know that is hard for us to wrap our minds around because we do not want to believe. Hell, I don't want to believe it. We don't want to believe that the police... Some officers could be that cold and that callous, but believe it, that happened to George Floyd. Those of us in the African-American community, we understand what it means not to have mercy at the hands of law enforcement officers among the police and other law enforcement agencies and many in the legal community understand what we call, it's called the N-word. I try not to use that word, so I won't. I pride myself in not using it, but the Negro rules, I'll just soften it a bit. Maybe I shouldn't soften it and just call it what it is, but it is D-O-R, disorderly conduct, obstruction of official business, and resisting arrest. Let me paint the picture for you. There's some yelling or, or something is going on, some commotion, and Law enforcement is called and they tell the people or person engaged, cut that out and come over here. And you as the black person say, you might say, no, I'm not coming over there and I'm not doing anything wrong without any other, no threatening, no menacing, just I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not breaking any laws and I'm not com coming over there. Well, that law enforcement officer will pin you with disorderly conduct. Think about that. Then the next comes obstruction of official business. And then the next comes resisting arrest. Because you start to ask the question, what, what, what have I done? Why are you doing this to me? Remember Sandra Bland? Go back and watch the video. That is exactly what happened to her. That happens to hundreds, they are even say thousands of African Americans every single day. There is a cultural divide. So Sandra Bland smoking a cigarette in her car, the officer wanted her to come out. She said, well, I haven't done anything wrong. Why are you doing this? She was labeled with having disorderly conduct, obstruction of official business. And then, you know what? You're resisting arrest. I'm not resisting anything. No, you are resisting arrest. See how he's countless times this happens to African-Americans. It is an unwritten rule. And so we must ask ourselves the question that generations before us have asked. When will this country truly, and I mean truly, see and treat African Americans as equals in this country, in the United States of America? It is certainly a long time coming My, my eyes are filled with tears right now just at the very thought of how many generations of African Americans have been asking for this country to see us and our humanity. So in every single way, this is bigger than George Floyd. This is about social, economic, political, racial, environmental, self-determination for black folks, period. And that the whole notion of racism and anti-blackness, and you will always hear me couple those because those are two different and also equal things that racism is a more global about what happens to one based on their their skin color their their ethnicity racism and it's about a power relationship people tend to forget that it's not about one individual discriminating against another but it's about an entire system that is created to cause a certain effect for one group against another it is about white supremacy, the whole notion that white people in America, and there I say the world, but that, that power flow goes directly to them, that white supremacy, that white people believe that they are somehow more superior than other people. And you don't even have to say, declare that in the mirror if you are white in America. 
it is in the fabric and the DNA of this country, just as racism is and anti-blackness is, so is white supremacy that you are, because you are born white, you are superior. There was pseudoscience in the 18th century, the 19th century, that reinforced this whole notion this that black people's skulls, their craniums are somehow smaller than white people and that makes white people more superior. Or how about the story of Ham? You know, the, the, the story that Ham was the darker child of Noah and because he was the darker child, he was a stand-in for black people and, and he was cursed. So, therefore, black people are cursed generation after generation after generation after generation the use of religion as a weapon against black people. See, this stuff is deep. And what happened to George Floyd just reminded us that we have so much unfinished business. Think about that in every single aspect of our lives, unfinished business. We need both truth and reconciliation and then action upon that truth and reconciliation that America would not be America today, but for the forced labor of its darker sons and daughters. And beyond that, the forced nature by which African Americans were relegated to second class citizenship, whether it's growing up and only being and being told that you could only be a domestic. I remember Malcolm X telling a story to Alex Haley in the autobiography of Malcolm X about how in the classroom, you know, they were having a discussion about what the various students in the class wanted to be. Malcolm X was the only black person in that class. And when it was his turn to tell, to declare what he wanted to be, he said he wanted to be a lawyer. And his teacher, his white teacher, promptly told him, get realistic about what you can be. You are good with your hands. Jesus was good with his hands. You can be a carpenter. Imagine that. As brilliant as Malcolm X was, right there at that young age, he, he was deterred and told that he could only fulfill a certain lot in life. That happened to countless African Americans over the generations, relegated to domestic work, relegated to doing the hardest, most menial jobs with no protection. That is what America has given African-Americans, although we have been able to overcome time and time again. It does not make the weight and the pain of what America has done and continues to do to us. It doesn't make it any easier. I would like to imagine what life would have been like if my ancestors could have enjoyed a full freedom in this country. You don't have to be in shackles and chains to be shackled mentally and physically and spiritually. You don't need a chain for that. In The Miseducation of the Negro, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week, it was called at first, before it grew into Black History Month. In his book, he talks about a psychology that is created among the African-American community. Even so much so that we're programmed to go through the back door. I'm paraphrasing him. And he said that if there was not a back door there, we would create one to go through it. That's how psychologically damaged we are. And the same with our white sisters and brothers and sisters and brothers from other ethnicities who are socialized to think in the same way. It is not just white people who are anti-black. Hispanic people can be anti-black as well. Other people, Asian people, you can be anti, very much anti-black is in the DNA of this country. So as I think about what the ancestors in Galveston, Texas were feeling when they were told you've been free for two years. I like to imagine what they would think about what is happening today and whether or not they would feel as though we really are free. In that way, Juneteenth is a reminder that we all must continue, that black people, that African Americans must continue to fight for their freedom every single moment, every single day, every single month, every single year, and every single generation that Juneteenth is perpetual. It is both a reminder that freedom comes at a cost and that you can never take your eye off the ball, that the pursuit of it never ends, that every generation is charged with advancing freedom and justice for all, every single generation. 
So we find ourselves in 2020 doing our part to advance the causes of justice and freedom and love and hope. And maybe, just maybe, one day will come, even if it's two years beyond, where we will get the word, Freedom Day is finally here. Yeah, we, 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 we don't have all the solutions, but we are seeking them. So many millions of people are willing to continue to put something on the line to get it, and that is the most important thing, that everyday people can turn the tide. You must believe in your power and believe in yourself and believe that when conscious-minded people unite, change will come. Sometimes it does not come as quickly as we would like, but it is coming. We must commit ourselves to ensuring that we will never ever be the same, that this moment will not repeat itself exactly this way, that we will commit to ensuring that there will be some generation, some some generation, not someday, but right now, envision, reimagine that there will be a generation of African-Americans who do not have to surmount the same type of hurdles, maybe some different ones, but not the same type. I hold out that there will be that day so that my grandson will not have to endure what my son had to endure who would not have to endure what his father endured, and his father's father, his father's father, and so on and so forth. I am living for that day, and not just living in that day, not doing anything, but waiting and living for that day in action. And that really is what all of the demonstrations are all about. We're fighting for the day to come in action, not sitting, sitting idly by and just hoping and wishing. And look, hope is beautiful. I am not one of those to disregard hope. Hope is a motivator. When human beings lose hope, we have lost it all. It is that fervor to continue to hope. You hear me talk about the three bones all the time, the wishbone, the jawbone, the backbone that my grandmother, Grandma Inez Emerson, gave to me and all of her grandchildren. The three bones, the wishbone, the jawbone, the backbone. The wishbone is for hoping and praying. See, she believed in that hope. She believed in prayer. But she did understand that scripture in the Christian tradition that faith without works is dead. So in all of our hoping and our praying, we must act. Wishbone, that the jawbone will give us courage to speak truth to power. That is what the demonstrators are out there right now saying to power. We will not sit idly by and let you do absolutely nothing. No, not again. That's that jawbone. And then my grandmother said the most important bone of them all is I like to mix in the super casual, fragilistic expialidocious bone is the backbone because that is the bone that gives us the courage to stand. And when we've done all to stand, we keep standing anyhow. The backbone undergirds every single thing that we do because you have to have courage to go against the system. You have to have courage to speak a certain type of truth. You have to have courage to hope and to pray and to dream, to make things better than what they are right now today. That backbone. And to know that we can't have a testimony without a test. And we really are being tested to determine whether or not we have courage enough, conviction enough, fight enough, love enough to do what it is in our time, to be that kind of change and to sacrifice something. So my grandmother's three bones are in action. I see it out there in those demonstrations. And although she's not here right now with us in this physical plane, I believe that my grandmother would be proud, not just of her granddaughter, but just proud to see people fighting for their right to be free. And after all, that has been not just the battle cry, that has been the very motivator of, of our existence in this country for black people. Our struggle has always been that of liberation. And when we are liberated, everybody is liberated. So let's unite together and let's get free. Hello Somebody is a production of Large Media Network. Our logo and web design was created by Grace & Co. Special thanks to other members of the Hello Somebody team. Tiffany Hale, 
Pepper Chambers, the hot one, Julia Griffin, Angelo Greco, and Anna Mesa. Now, if you would like to support our production, please become a member on patreon.com forward slash hello somebody. And finally, come join us for more conversation on my social media channels at Nina Turner. Next time on Hello Somebody, Killer Mike himself joins me. This is an episode you do not want to miss.